Thank you. I should clarify, I'm just the policy director. Christopher Neal is the research director there. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm aware that uh, we're getting very close to the break. Uh, so I'll try to be quick. Uh, I, I can't promise you witty. Uh, I think everybody else so far has presented some graph that looks like this. Uh, this talk presents a challenge to me. I want to talk about innovations in water management in the high plains. Everything that I talk about today, somebody in this room will know more about than me. Uh, and that's not usually the audience that I find myself in. Very often I talk to people outside of the state and my first slide is showing where Nebraska is on the map. <laughs> uh, and that is the level of the learning. Uh, so uh, please be patient with me. So what I want to do today is provide uh, some broader context, some overview of things that are happening within the High Plains region broadly uh, that uh, are extremely innovative within water management. Some of you know they're innovative. Some of you perhaps don't know how innovative they are. So here we have the standard High Plains map. Uh, in white are outlined, uh, outlined all the different NRDs and GMDs and GCDs that we have. So there are a lot of different institutions uh, with a wide variety of rules. So uh, I'm going to start off by just setting the scene very broadly. Uh, I show this figure a lot. In a sense, how we use water to irrigate hasn't changed much in 8,000 years. Right? You add water to crops when the soil is dry. So that, that part hasn't changed very much. Uh, groundwater plays a critical role, we know, in mitigating drought and climate change risk. And through that, it maintains our agricultural productivity. It maintains our rural economies. We know all of this. Uh, more recently, we've become much more aware of the role that groundwater also plays in sustaining our freshwater ecosystem services. So, again, we all know this, but this is a reminder of uh, why groundwater matters. I'm going to take a minute to talk about U.S. agricultural groundwater policy and law. Uh, the first thing there is a bit of a red herring. There is really no federal level law dealing with agricultural groundwater use. Again, to my colleagues in Europe, this comes as a shock. You know, their first question always is, what is the federal policy you have for groundwater in the US? And it's very hard for them to understand that we don't have that. And even that at the state level, things are enormously different. If we compare groundwater law between Nebraska and Kansas, for example, there are enormous differences. And then Texas, again, is different once again. So we have different regulations at the state level. We have different regulations at the local level, whether that's the NRDs, the GMDs, uh, and there is enormous variability. I'm, I'm personally most familiar with the NRD system. I'm learning more about the GMDs and what's happening in Texas with the groundwater conservation districts, but there is a lot of local governance here, and these systems are, are set up often by local groups of producers. And so again, that, that's quite unusual. And then there is a hyper-local level, so some of these Institutions really occur with very small groups of farmers. So Sheridan, the Sheridan Six Lima is, I believe, around 120 farmers. Uh, some of these other very localized systems and, and management areas of concern are very, very small. So I'm going to talk about three things that are innovative in the High Plains right now. Uh, the first is agricultural water metering. Uh, people have talked about it today. Uh, we all talk about it quite regularly. And what I mean by that is agricultural water metering for the purposes of regulation rather than for the purposes of an individual farmer trying to optimize their production. Now, uh, as far as I know, the Upper Republican Natural Resources District was the first district to meter anywhere in the world. Uh, and they did so a long time before anybody else. So uh, they started metering in 1978 and they were fully metered by 1982. And again, this is something that people outside of the High Plains region really struggle to understand. It's not something that people know about. Uh, elsewhere in the High Plains region, uh, there are growing numbers of meters being used by management districts. Again, we've heard about some of these today. They're happening both, uh, all of Kansas is metered, for example. Texas is increasing the amount of metering it has. Within Nebraska, even outside of the Platte and Republican River basins, we're now having metering in some areas. Now, uh, there are still many meters, many areas that aren't metered, uh, but what I'd put to you is this. Right now, as far as I know, uh, there are more meters currently in the High Plains Aquifer region than in any other aquifer in the world. Okay? 
that's a statement that hopefully is news to everyone. Right? Is, that, is that news to everyone? Okay, so one fact. I managed one, one new fact so far. Now, think about how much isn't metered in the high planes. Okay, and yet, we're further ahead than anybody else in the world. Now, we know that meters are controversial. Uh, I think that's possibly the understatement of my talk. Uh, some districts are fully metered. Some districts have explicit policies, policies that they will not meter. Uh, it is possible to monitor pumping restrictions even without metering uh, through the certification of irrigated acreage. Now, there is measurement error in that. But it is possible to have restrictions even without metering. But again, at least within the high plains, the longer term trend is towards an increase in metering. Uh, just the area is further ahead than people realize. The next thing I'm going to talk about is groundwater tradable permit systems. This is something that I do a lot of research on, both on the theoretical and applied sides. Uh, I could talk about any of these topics all day. I think I have about 10 minutes left if I have my, my timing right. So I'm just going to skim the high points. Uh, so the idea is in places where you have uh, allocations and aggregate restrictions on pumping, uh, it might be possible to reallocate the water in a way that's economically efficient and very, very cheap or free for the regulatory body. Now, consideration of spatial externalities means you have to figure out what your pumping does to other people or other places, uh, and, or rather to other people and other stream flows in other places. Spatial externalities and third party effects are often the reason why you have regulation. Right, so stream flow depletion is one of the primary reasons for regulation itself. And as a result of this, when we look at tradable permit systems, we have very complex rules. They have to deal with zoning, you have to deal with third party impacts, you have to deal with stream depletion, there are sometimes offsets. Um, however, unlike surface water markets that are much better developed, you don't have conveyance issues in groundwater tradable systems. The reason is one person turns off a well, another person turns on a well. Okay, that's, a, that's a very efficient system. When you look at surface water markets, people really care about consumptive use. The experience in the high plains uh, and elsewhere in groundwater markets is that in general there's less attention paid to consumptive use and the unit traded is applied water or irrigated acreage. That's not that people don't care about consumptive use, uh, it's just that it's harder to measure in a groundwater setting and if you're metering already there's a pragmatic reason that it's easier to deal with. Uh, there are many other considerations. Again, I could talk about this all day, but I shan't. So there's paper water, there's carryover provisions. Uh, I think the Upper Republican Natural Resources District every year adds more provisions to its trading uh, uh, requirements. And importantly, there's enormous institutional variation and complexity in trading schemes that are available. So within the High Plains Aquifer, there are a growing number of regions that have emergent, informal, and more formal groundwater markets too. Within the High Plains region, the Republican and Platte River Basin stand out. Uh, within Kansas, the Sheridan 6 Lima uh, does have trading on the books, but as far as I know, no trading has taken place. I'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, every time I give this talk, I add more countries to this list. So there's now trading in Australia, there's now trading in other regions of the US, in the Edwards Aquifer, in Arizona, in California, New Zealand, China, and South Asia. Uh, one point that I want to make, and then hopefully this is a, another new fact for you, there's, there's more variation in the trading mechanisms uh, within Nebraska uh, than within the rest of the US uh, in how we trade permits to pump groundwater. And that's partly a result of the NRD system. Uh, but that creates an interesting opportunity for research and understanding from a local perspective what works. I think I'm at least the third or fourth speaker today to put up this exact same figure. Uh, it's a very popular figure. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the driving forces of regulations for groundwater management. Now, if you read the papers, and I know that many of us read the papers, um, aquifer depletion is very, very popular in the news. Right? This idea that our aquifers are drying up uh, and we need to do something about it. However, when we look at things that have actually had an impact in groundwater management, to date, most of the things that have been driving binding change in groundwater management 
are related to surface water, groundwater interaction. So how groundwater pumping affects surface water to date has been the most important driver of meaningful change in policy. Now, within the last few years, uh, this has been changing. So within the last few years, and, a, and, a, and a, in particular as a result of recent drought, we've had a number of cases where enforceable regulations are being put in place uh, due to aquifer depletion and well interference. From my perspective, this is very exciting because it's new. It's new. Um, I'm going to give two examples here. One is the Sheridan 6 Lima that we talked about that is incredibly innovative in that the group of producers petition, petitioned the state to change their water rights to allow them to voluntarily reduce pumping. And that's a unique situation. Uh, we're all watching that very closely. Uh, the Lima only went in in January 2014 officially. And last year was a relatively wet year. And so I'm not surprised that their water use, the longer term goal is to reduce water use 20%. I'm not terribly surprised that their water use went down last year because it was a wet year. I'll be very interested to see what happens in the future. I just picked the lower Elkhorn NRD as an example within Nebraska. Uh, they've been having well interference problems. And as a result of that, they've actually started putting allocations and meters on some smaller management areas within the state. Again, I think these are things we'll probably see more of, uh, but they're very unusual. Uh, to give you a sense of how unusual things are, uh, I'm going to end with an example from outside of the High Plains, which is California. Now, I don't have the uh, 2014 depletion map here. I think that would really just be a black hole centered in the Central Valley. Uh, now, I could talk for several hours about California. I'm not going to do that. What I'll say is this. In 2014, they put in place uh, something that they call a, uh, gr a Sustainable Groundwater Management Act that sets up a framework in which now, for the first time, they will <coughs> attempt to regulate groundwater use statewide. Uh, it sets up a series of timelines and, and targets they have to meet in order to do that, in order to deal with this crisis. Now. Uh, I think it's a step in the right direction, but to give you some sense of how far, uh, I guess I can use the sense, is there anybody from California in the room? I guess I have to be careful now. Okay, so um, if they hit all of their targets, then in 10 years, California will be somewhere between 30 and 50 years behind the high plains in terms of their institutions, uh, in that there are currently no plans to meter or allocate or certify acreage uh, in California. The, what they put into place uh, provides a framework by which down the line there will be local management institutions that down the line have to put in local management plans. Uh, but those targets are, in some cases, 10, 15 years in the future. And so again, it's a situation that many of us are, are watching carefully, and I think that uh, uh, many people there could learn a lot from the situations here we have in the High Plains. So I'll leave you with that. I think I'm on time. Thank you very much.